When the coach says, I've got to establish the running game. Typically, you have to run the ball to set up the pass. He is, if you'll excuse me, Cameron, he's full of That's the biggest myth in sports. That shows you how many people don't know what they don't know. You think you know, but you don't know. We all don't know everything. And you never will. NFL history is laden with larger than life figures. That's a legend right there. You're just a squirrel trying to get a nut. Today, the league's landscape has enough nutty myths to get 32 teams through even the coldest of winters. I can't feel my hands or feet, man. I'm freaking out. Act like you're an athlete, even if it's a myth. We chose the top 10 pieces of football common knowledge. Our experts decided what was truth and what was myth. I think to be a truly great myth, it's, there's also got to be a great debate. Defense wins championships. Very true. Mm. That's a tough one. Well, there's an exception to that. Quarterback needs a rocket arm. Uh, that is the truth. That is uh, perception. No. Okay. All these myths are kind of uh, interconnected a little bit. We may never know the identity of who's behind all this mythical mischief. Oh, come on, who's that? But we will unmask each myth's naked truth. The number 10 football myth of all time, tackle statistics are accurate. The reason that the, the statistic is worthless is because every team does it differently. I believe them about as much as I could believe that I could sell my house for what, what it's appraised at for real estate taxes, okay? Why? Why? During the NFL's infancy, different rules made tackles easier to record. You had to hold the guy down for about five seconds, and, and that was really a tackle. Every motion Willis makes is pointed toward the tackle, and when he makes them, brother, they stay tackled. Since then, the five-second rule has become synonymous with food on the ground, not ball carriers. As the game sped up, tackles became harder to track, and defenders are happy to help inflate their statistics. Players will go to the statisticians or relay word to the statisticians. Hey, man, I made more tackles than that. You better wise up. Desperate people do desperate things. Ray Lewis in Baltimore. Ray Lewis gets far more tackles than he's actually involved with, but they want to keep Ray happy. So, he gets the benefit of the statistician's dollars. Fourth down! Fourth down! Fourth down! Other times, tackles can run into film room padding. If a guy had seven tackles on Sunday, somehow it was 11 on Monday when the game film was reviewed. We'd actually have players that we would start to say, you know, the guy's a great player on Monday. Too bad he didn't show up too much on Sunday. The most worthless thing is letting a coach decide who's in on a tackle. You see a, a three-yard run in a pile of dust. I mean, who really made the tackle? When a guy jumps on the pile, is that part of the tackle? The coaches will give assists to guys that were in the neighborhood. Sometimes the coaches will say, okay, everybody gets a tackle, okay? You get a tackle, you get a tackle, you get a tackle. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> then you start adding it all up and say, this is mathematically impossible. Are they counting tackles from practice? You always both <laughs> Now let me see you make the tackle. Our number 10 myth says tackle stats aren't accurate. But does that mean tackles are worthless? Tackles are important. If you're out there getting tackles, yeah, sometimes you get a few easy ones. It's still what the game is all about, stopping the other guy. You gotta tackle him. If there isn't a tackle, then everybody keeps running like Forrest Gump. Everybody grabbing out there. Nobody tackling. Just grabbing, everybody. Grab, grab, grab. Nobody tackling. You know if a guy's a good defender or not. And numbers, I think, are meaningless when it comes to tackles. Coming up, 
when does putting its best foot forward set a team back? That doesn't make sense to me. Who can guess one football myth that didn't make our countdown? It's that old wives' tale that rookie NFL head coaches cannot win. I do not think, do not think at all that is true. It used to seem like a fact, considering the NFL coaching debuts of men like Lou Holtz, Steve Spurrier, and Bobby Petrino. But in 2008, the trio of John Harbaugh, Mike Smith, and Tony Sperano all became NFL head coaches for the first time, and each led his team to the playoffs. Now, it's easy to believe that a rookie head coach can win, but would you believe our next myth? The number nine football myth of all time. It's tough to repeat as the Super Bowl champion. I think it's a myth to say it's hard to repeat. There are teams that have made that ride over and over again. If you have a good model of keeping good players on your team, developing good players through the draft, you're going to be in the Super Bowl over and over again. Two in a row. How sweet it is. How is it? hard to repeat as a Super Bowl champion a myth. I'm going to throw the red challenge flag on myth number nine because it is difficult. This is algebra. It's hard to win to begin with. Winning back to back is even harder to a more exponential level. That was some quick math there, huh? I mean, the last 25 years, how many teams have done it? Funny you should ask. <laughs> Since the Super Bowl began, eight teams have won the title and then repeated. The Lombardi Packers, Shula Dolphins, the Knoll Steelers did it twice, the Montana Niners, Triplet Cowboys, Elway's Broncos, and Belichick's Patriots. You can't get the title unless you knock the champ out. And we the champ. That means of the 17 franchises that have won the Super Bowl, seven of them have won two straight. And remember, the Steelers have won two straight two times. So eight of the 17 winning franchises, almost 50%, have gone... Back to back, baby! Back to back, baby! Yeah, maybe other teams will be gunning for you because you are the defending champs, but you gotta do your thing. We know we're the best team! Let's just go out and prove it today! It's just hard to win a Super Bowl, so it's no harder to repeat than it is to win that first one. Where the problem comes in is that it's like hard to three-peat. And they are world champions once again. People get that mixed up. They say, well, it's hard to repeat. Yeah, no, it's hard to repeat after you've repeated. Now the question, can they have a three-peat? Yeah. It's much harder to repeat as Super Bowl champion in the era of salary cap and free agency than it was before. Green Bay didn't have to worry about a salary cap. Cowboys didn't have to worry about it. Pittsburgh didn't have to worry about it. The Pittsburgh Steelers of the 1970s. The best team ever. Would they be saying that about the Steelers if they'd had a cap and Chuck Noll and had to pick between Swan and Stallworth or Lambert and Ham? That's why Bill Belichick's accomplishments at New England may be the most impressive in history for a coach. It's hard to repeat as AFC West champion. It's hard to repeat as AFC conference champion, let alone Super Bowl champion. It is Super Bowl 11. To win a Super Bowl, everything has to go perfect. The cheerleaders got to be perfect. The ball boys got to be perfect. You better catch it. The coaches got to be perfect. Everything's got to be perfect. But it can only be perfect one year in a row. Bottom line is, if you are good enough to win a Super Bowl, then you're probably good enough to get back. Usually a team that good is going to be that good the following year, and they'll be in the race. Cowboys back to back in that half. From a myth standpoint, <laughs> no. Yeah, you, you can repeat. It's just you can't three-peat. The number eight football myth of all time, you should punt on fourth down. Number eight. Teams should be a lot more aggressive than they are. Who determined this? A college professor. A college professor that's never coached a game in his life. So you're going to tell me about the guy from Cal over there that has this formula that says you should go for it on fourth down. I don't know that his study is based on, number one, enough data. I use data from every single NFL game for three years. Teams would, on average, be better off going for it. If it's, on average, good to do something, then it, each individual case, it can't be bad. You ask him if his mortgage is on the line, if it's fourth and eight, and you don't make it. What do you got? Boy, 
yards are gained and lost on punts than on any other play in pro football. Punts like this 90-yarder by Don Chandler can change the tenor of an entire game. I don't mind punting when you're 25 or 30 yard line, but if you're the 45 yard line, the opposing team, why do you want to punt? So you're saying punt it on the 30 yard line? You may get a net of maybe 14, 15 yards. It's just going to gain 10 yards. You're punting the ball away. Ball goes in the end zone. Comes out to the 20. No, no. Hey, kicked it in the end zone. That doesn't make sense to me. I think the economist is on to something. A good coach understands. Go for it at the key moments in the game. Let's see. Let's go for it. Let's go. Let's go for it. 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 Where a riverboat gambler type, a Jerry Glanville type, may go for it in any instance, and it may backfire in his face. Anybody nervous? Anybody scared? I like coaches that gamble. I remember Patera up in Seattle. They didn't have many good players, so he used all four downs. You could never come off the field. I smell something here. It's too early to kick that long, but maybe he will. We'll see. Even on field goals, he's faking them. It's down. They fake it. Jordan runs for the run. He's got a first down. He's using every down to try and gain yards. First down. I like that. That's good. Our number eight myth says that teams should punt on fourth and short. So is it better to throw in the towel or sweat it out by going for it? Y'all punt it. Y'all give it up. Oh, man. Y'all stink. I don't think fourth and one now is an automatic punt like it used to be. Teams need to go for it more on fourth and short, especially at midfield. We're not punting, though. We're not punting. You are going to get that fourth down more than half the time, and it easily makes up for the field position that you lose during the times that you fail. I think we're seeing more and more, you know, that myth going away. We're not going to punt this year anyhow, so you don't have to worry about it. Coming up, which myth is cool with some people? I don't think there is any such thing as poor sportsmanship. But has Don Shula hot under the collar? I really have a distaste for what they're doing in that situation. Turnovers are huge. Great football teams do a great job of not turning it over. And the story of this game, turnovers. We need some turnovers. But some think that turnovers deciding games is not a myth. Turnovers decide games is not a misperception. Of course, turnovers decide games. Everything that you do decides games. Everyone remembers the catch. Most forget the turnovers. The 49ers turned the ball over six times and won an NFC Championship game. They tell you today, oh, we can't turn the ball. They turned the ball over six times and won. The 49ers had six turnovers as a team. In a 2006 game, Rex Grossman had six turnovers by himself in a Bears victory. They are who we thought they were, and we let them off the hook. The number seven football myth of all time. Dome teams are soft. Dome teams are fast. I don't know if they're soft. Are dome teams soft? Uh, yes. I, I, don't, I don't buy that notion. If you're a good football team, you're a good football team, and you can win anywhere. Dome teams are soft because they play inside. That was a, uh, a fact for many years. They weren't tough enough. Jackson just blasted and dragged him into the end zone. If you brought dome teams into very cold, wintry conditions, it was going to be a problem. But if you brought any open-air southern team, a Miami team, a San Diego team, they'd be at the same disadvantage that a dome team would be. San Diego wishing that this game could have been played on a warm day. The biggest mistake the Vikings ever made was going into a dome. When they played in the old Met in Bloomington, they had a home field advantage. They wound up going to four Super Bowls. Let's go now, that's our ball! The reason the Minnesota Vikings have not been back to a Super Bowl is because of the fact that they went to a dome. They have never been the same team. The Falcons have stolen the thunder from the Vikings. It's like getting punched in the gut. The Minnesota Vikings are anything but soft. You can't run against them. They got pass rushes outside. They got a power running game. How are they anything but the antithesis of what we think of the old dome teams? You'll find some really tough teams that played in domes, and you, you can't call them soft. Teams like the Houston Oilers. They were a very physical team. 
Jim Mora's New Orleans Saints. They sent four linebackers to the Pro Bowl. They weren't a soft team. But you don't know, and you never will. The 99 Rams weren't supposed to win. They're a dome team. The NFC Championship game. They had to do all the things dome teams are not supposed to do. They had to play a close game and come up with the one play at the end that allowed them to get through. Far sideline at this Dome teams have played 10 conference championship games on the road, outdoors. They have lost all 10. Maybe it's not a myth. If you play in a dome, you're going to need speed. You're going to want to probably have lighter players. Well, now all of a sudden, you go outdoors, and it's freezing, and you're playing a power football game. That's a whole different kind of game. Physical cold weather football. Dome teams are soft. If that's the case, put on the uh, highlight film of the Colts winning in Baltimore on their playoff run in 2006. The, the Colts have it! It was cold, and you got the Ravens and Ray Lewis. They were the big, tough team, and the Colts were the nice cotton swab team. They took the game to the Ravens. Fired away and picked up by the Colts, and the game is now over. This team proved capable of playing anywhere. The Colts are world champions! We think of the old Dome teams as being spread them out, passing teams that are a little soft, and they were. I don't think that's true anymore. It just comes down to what kind of team you are and how good you are. I do not think Dome teams are any more soft. That's a bad one. You gotta get that off your list. The number six football myth of all time. Icing the kicker works. All the time I ice the kicker. Time out! Time out! Time out! Time out! Time out! Time out! Icing the kicker has been done for years. But is its effectiveness myth or truth? Time out, time out. I think by and large that is a big myth that you can ice the kicker because they want to be iced, okay? I think sometimes kickers maybe like the extra time. And they think, oh, they're going to think about this, but I, I, I don't think it works. Coaches think, hey, this can get in their psyche and make them think about the kick just a little bit longer. I kind of think it's hogwash, though. You can ice me all you want. I'm still going to hit it. That's my attitude. Yeah, it iced me fine. I mean, I had a 50-yarder after an ice. And it is good. Oh, Stover wins it. Please give me more time. It's great. It just makes me even that much more confident that I'm going to be more successful with that field goal. Sorry to bring this up again, Bills fans, but obviously not everyone feels the same confidence after being iced. Timeout. A timeout is taken. The Giants want to try to ice him here. I do remember. I think there was a timeout called, so uh, I'm sure things kind of broke down uh, in some sense because of that. The old uh, ice the kicker. Arm extended. Puts it down. On the way. It's long enough. Some kickers freeze under pressure. Others have ice water in their veins. I played with a kicker that's probably going to go in the Hall of Fame, Adam Vinatieri. The greatest clutch kicker probably in the history of the National Football League. I'd say he's going to the Hall of Fame for all the clutch kicks he's made. So the times that, you know, opposing teams that try to ice him, you know, he, it made him even more clutch. Prime example was the snowball that we had. All the big linemen with the size 14 shoes were helping me try to clear a patch of snow. Coach Gruden called timeout, which, hindsight looking back at it, I'd like to thank him for it. He gave us more opportunity to clear more snow and give me just a little bit better of a spot. The crowd will tell you whether he makes it or not. Kick is up. Patriots! Hey, hey! Patriots win! You know what's really ridiculous, what really gets my goat, is the, the coaches that call timeout at the last possible second. This is 53 for the win. Nick Folk is on line. Is it long enough? For a coach on the sideline to have the official come over and stand next to him and say, right before that ball is snapped, I want to call a timeout. You know, I think that is wrong. I think it's one of the worst things that we've done as far as rule changes in the game. What a call by Dick Duran. It's a great call. <laughs> yeah. And you know what? It's a terrible rule. I really have a distaste for what they're doing. I don't think there is any such thing as poor sportsmanship. Our game is about execution. I would run up the score against every team if I could. And pressure. I would ice the kicker. Making things happen. I would call a late timeout. As opposed to trying to gimmick up the game. I would throw things on the field. My sock, a red flag, whatever I had, my shoe. Like, do people talk about that guy in New England 
with the snowblower. Enter the Foxboro Brushman, who cleared the path to victory. The snowplow game is the most unfair act that's ever been perpetrated in the history of the National Football League. Who cares how you win, just win. Some kicks go in. Lawrence Tynes has kicked the Giants to the Super Bowl. Others do not. And it is no good. But it's clear oh, that icing oh, the oh, kicker oh, doesn't oh, play a big part in the outcome. That is a myth. Icing the kicker does not work. I would love someone to show me when icing the kicker works. Maybe it works in high school. What you're banking on is that the kicker is just going to overthink and take himself out of his form. But what else are kickers doing all day long but thinking? Coming up, see why quarterbacks aren't the only people who need a rocket arm. I am going to throw a brick through my television. Before we reveal the rest of our list, let's recap the gap we've already covered. Number 10, tackle totals indicate who's a good player and neighbor. Coaches will give assists to guys that were in the neighborhood. Number 9. Back-to-back -back Super Bowl runs are too much for any team to stomach. Pop the emodium time. Number eight, fourth downs, no time to be liberal. Hold it, hold it, hold it. Too conservative. Number seven, dome teams are softer than a pillow. And hey, let's not fall asleep. Number six, if you ice a kicker, he'll melt down. And now, the number five football myth of all time. A quarterback needs a rocket arm. Quarterback needs a rocket arm. You know, I like a quarterback with a really good arm. Let's start with that. I think that's a fact. I really do. It now opens your offense up to all possibilities. Hey, we can do it all. Tell this rocket. It's rocket. Now we don't have to knock off the top 10% or 15% of it because he can't make certain throws down the field. Can Anthony do it? I think you need to thread the needle in the NFL. I think you need to zip it in there. I don't know if too many pop gun arms that have won Super Bowls. And of course, if I start naming names, then I can't see these quarterbacks in public anymore. Yeah, right. A quarterback needs a rocket arm. <clears throat> False. <laughs> no, does not need a rocket arm. How's your Marcus Russell doing these days? Going for a bomb down the right sideline. He overthrew his man. It's intercepted. How's Kyle Bowler? It's a shame to explain the obvious, but that was an ill-advised pass right there. That rocket arm could be throwing the ball into the hands of guys wearing jerseys for the other team. No more rocket balls, please. Throwing it hard makes no sense when you don't know where it's going. Yeah, who was he throwing that to? Nobody was open. I've seen those guys with a strong arm, that ball saying, shoo! Shoo! And they're never close. A quarterback needs a rocket arm if he's in the in, in NASA. I do not regard the first man in space as a sign of the weakening of the uh, free world. And we know that NASA's got a lot of problems now also. I've seen plenty of quarterbacks that could throw the ball through a cinder block wall. What a passer. They couldn't play dead. So if neither zombies nor quarterbacks need an arm that can double as a weapon on a fighter jet, what is important? Being a leader and dealing with the media and the pressures and all those other things, those mental things, other than just your arm. The quarterback lives in a world of pressure. How well he lives with it and reacts to it determines how good he is. Ron Jaworski had a rocket arm. Roman Gabriel had a rocket arm. Kurt Warner doesn't have a rocket arm. Woo! Got a rocket in your ass. That's a way to move. The quarterback has to have a good arm, but a rocket arm, no, no. Guys like Drew Brees, Tom Brady, those guys could learn how to throw deep, even though when they were coming out of college it was, oh, Drew Brees' arm isn't as strong as Michael Vick's. Pennington successfully didn't have a rocket arm. What a throw by Chad Pennington. Joe Montana successfully didn't have a rocket arm. And boy, did he rip a beauty, a perfect pass to Jerry Rice. Helps, helps. And we all want to be Joe Flacco. Hey, he's cute. Don't you think so, Buttercup? <laughs> it's nice if he has one. I don't think it's a prerequisite to be a great one. You don't have to have a gun to be a successful NFL quarterback. Joe Montana said 
I don't throw darts at balloons. I throw balloons at darts. Case closed. The number four football myth of all time. You have to run to set up the pass. One of the most cherished football myths is a misguided strategy. It's the philosophy that says you must run the ball to set up the pass. True. No. Very true. I don't think so. Myth the reality. Uh, talking to an offensive lineman here now, don't forget that. That's reality. When the coach says, I've got to establish the running game, he is, if you'll excuse me, camera, he's full of shit. John Madden says that all the time, running opens up passing. They're going to have to do a little running. Forget that. If I hear another guy talk about running to set up the pass, I am going to throw a brick through my television. Typically, you have to run the ball to set up the pass. Knock it off with that. I'll go back to the 1960 Eagles. They did not have a great running attack, but they had Tommy McDonald, Pete Letzlaff, and Bobby Walston to play tight end. They started to implement pass first rather than run. The Dutchman aimed for McDonald, great play. Well, we definitely saw this year that the whole premise that you have to have a running game is a faulty one. The running game's always been a cornerstone of the Pittsburgh Steelers, but it wasn't this year. What a throw. you got to give Roethlisberger credit. And then, you know, Arizona had the 32nd ranked running game. Kurt Warner's not going to get there. They couldn't run it at all, and yet Kurt Warner was still able to take apart defenses. And they get all the way to the Super Bowl. One, two, three, Super Bowl! I think you need a mixture. I think you need to run when they think pass and pass when they think run. That's a great cliche. I think you do the other way around, too. Pass when they think run. And run when they think pass. What? In the percentage, you're doing statistics. Statistics show you have to run to set the pass. But you get some quarterbacks, you don't need to do that. Unless you have Tom Brady or Peyton Manning. There's no quarterback who can consistently carry his team without having a running game. There are those that say you must establish the run. But unfortunately, often by the time you may have established it, you're behind 21 to nothing. Bill Walsh was not going to use the run to set up the pass. When you come underneath, you got all the pursuit coming back toward you. However, he did use the pass to set up the run, and he would use certain passes as if they were run plays. Why bang your head against the wall if it's only four steps to go, to go around it? We proved winning a world championship. You didn't need a star running game. You ran late to finish the game. Teams that win have a lot of carries and a lot of yards because they're running out the clock. You run to seal the win. You pass to get the lead. We threw the football so we could run the football at times because it makes it easier. Safeties will move back to guard against the pass, and then you have to run. Cuts left. You don't need to establish the run, because if you're running into the line for three yards of carry the whole game, what are you trying to make the other team scared of? That you'll run it into the line for four yards of carry? You know, there's two schools of thought. Run to set up the pass. Pass to set up the run. That is true. It's up to... You have to run to set up the pass. Your offensive coordinator. Unless you pass to set up the run. Well... You have to outscore the opponent. That's, that's a tenet that I believe in. It helps. Coming up, <laughs> is it a myth to say our experts are cracking up? <laughs> Find out. <laughs> Only the media myths made our list. Here's a leftover that didn't quite pass mustard. How about pre-game meals? The Steelers are going to win because they're hungry. They didn't have no breakfast today. That you had to have steak and eggs. Steak and eggs and orange juice. Yeah, that's what you had to eat before you played. Juice, juice, juice! juice, juice. Steak and eggs gotta be the worst thing for you to go out and play. It doesn't even digest. i got my stomach doing the wild tooth right now. Mark Van Egan used to have lasagna and a milkshake. That's the what you're supposed to have, something good like that. Uh, I don't think that's a myth. <laughs> they didn't make the list. Oh. The number three football myth of all time. You can't lose your job due to injury. That's a good rule if we're all in grade school. Well, I think you can lose your job due to injury. Just ask Drew Bledsoe. Bledsoe rolls to the right. 25, 30, oh, and out of bounds right at the stick. And I'm not sure. He's 
going to get up on this one. Well, Drew Bledsoe got hurt, and they went with Tom Brady. Tom Brady's in the game. You're right. There's no reason to put Drew Bledsoe back in the game. The Patriots are Super Bowl champions! Some of the NFL's greatest have gained and lost jobs due to injuries. Joe Montana lost a job because of injury. And if Joe Montana can lose a job because of injury, anybody can. You put the best player on the field, the guy that's got the hot hand, gives you the best opportunity to win. And sometimes it's that Kurt Warner that steps in for Trent Green. We will rally around Kurt Warner, and we'll play good football. And you never look back. St. Louis, the best football team in the world! We've seen many examples where... Let's say a quarterback got hurt during the season. We won seven with Elvis. He's our captain. Then came back near the end of the year, and the other quarterback had been playing well. Gannon to throw. Touchdown! Kansas City takes the lead! The coach feels, oh, i got to give it back to my number one guy. Elvis is our quarterback for the duration, as far as I'm concerned. And that turned out to be the wrong decision. Quarterback into the end zone. Pass is going to be knocked away! The Bronco defense holds! And while everyone thinks they won't lose their job due to injury, they only need to hear two words, Wally Pip. The Wally Pip phenomena is alive and well in the NFL. You know who Wally Pip is? Uh, who is that? Never heard of him. Nope. Wally Pip was a hell of a baseball player that was replaced when he got hurt. Uh -huh. No one ever heard of Wally Pip again. Wally Pip couldn't have lost his job due to an injury, but I think he sort of did. We can all be Wally Pip, believe me. Brett Favre played Lou Gehrig to Don Mikowski's Wally Pip in 1992. And Mikowski is down and hurting, Max. He is hurting. And the rest was history. History tonight as quarterback Brett Favre starts his 200th consecutive game behind center. You start in this league for 200 straight games, uh, you, you get something special. Shaken up on the play is Greasy. Yeah, it looks like his, his right ankle, Rick. When Bob stayed on the ground, I knew that there was something that was pretty bad and he probably would have to come out of the ball game. So I put Earl Morrill into the ball game and all he did was make plays to help us win not only that game, but then go undefeated the rest of the way. Down the corner, Warfield, touchdown! But in the Super Bowl, Shula made a decision that was the exception to the myth. Everything I decided on is based on the fact that Bob Greasy was now healthy. That decision propelled the Dolphins to perfection. The Dolphins have completed the greatest season in NFL history. There's a lot of guys that have lost jobs due to injuries. It's just one of those things coaches like to say to sound fair. That's a fallacy. That's from a coach who was too afraid to make a decision that he really wanted to. Sims is starting to limp off the field here. Now we'll get Jeff Hostetler. I agree that that's the case with a lot of teams, but I think that's one of the dumbest things that I hear coaches say. In the NFL, you can always lose your job because of injury. Maybe in college, maybe in high school, they have that role, but in the NFL, you have to win. It's about 600 pounds on top of Schrader. Why do you want to go to the lesser player just because of some unwritten code? It's just dumb. You want to win. If you're injured, you better get back out there quick because this train will move without you. He really got hit. Life happens. Got somebody else who's better than you? Take a seat. Coming up, the new hit game. Truth or myth? Not a myth. Very, very true. I think it's a bunch of bunk. For the past 20 years, parody is said to have given every team an equal chance to win. But is that a myth or a fact? Parody is a good word. I like that Every year, every team feels they have a chance. It's good for the game. Let's go out and shock the world, though. I understand where people love the dynasties. They love the Steelers. They love the Cowboys. But I also love the fact that the Seattle Seahawks, the Arizona Cardinals, could make it to a Super Bowl. The Arizona Cardinals are going to their first Super Bowl. But the Browns and Lions have been left behind to fail when others flourish. I think there are still some teams that are going to be left at the bus stop when the parody bus drives on. Paul Tagliabue's greatest word, parody, it's what he wanted. He got it, and it's still not quite hit Detroit yet. The Lions fall to 0-16. Detroit Lions. They know, they, 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 they know nothing. Wow. Lions. Bad. The number two football myth of all time. Defense wins championships. 
Defense wins championships. Defense wins championships. I'm a defensive guy. If I'm not on the field, we have no chance of winning the ball game. That shouldn't even be on the list. Defense gets the offense the ball back again. Defense do win championships. I don't think that that is a myth. Even though I play offense, I would tend to agree. Most times, defense does win championships. Case in point with Oakland uh, playing against Tampa Bay in the Super Bowl. Oakland had number one offense, and Tampa Bay had the top defense, and then uh, they shut them down. The defense got us to the Super Bowl, and they're trying to win it for us. That's the side. At the 40, Derek Brooks, 30. There it is. We're going to win the Super Bowl. Defense does not win championship. It will give you a chance, and your offense has to win it for you. The 1999 Rams' number one ranked offense beat almost everyone on their way to the Super Bowl. If you have the type of offense that we had, your defense can be average, and your offense can win you games. Touchdown, Rams! Hope. 1999 Rams have proven that a good offense can win a championship, too. That's the game! It's over! And if they didn't prove it, then the 97 and 98 Broncos proved it. This one's for John. If they didn't prove it, then the 1980 Raiders proved it. This was our finest hour. This was the finest hour in the history of the Oakland Raiders. When it really comes down to crunch time so often, that offense is going to be the one that's going to have to take you down the field to produce your points. Don Coriel's Cardinals of the 70s had a red-hot offense. Their defense was not. We didn't have a very good defense. We could have scored thousands of points on any team we wanted to. We just didn't have a defense that could actually stop anyone. Hugot had no trouble beating his man. Any quarterback who has won multiple Super Bowl titles has done so with a great defense. If you were to talk to Terry Bradshaw, he's a blonde bomber, he would have to say yes because Joe Green and Jack Lambert would kill him. That's ridiculous. You hear defense wins championships all the time, but if you look back at history, Pittsburgh was. But Pittsburgh's offense still had Terry Bradshaw, Mike Webster, Swan Stallworth in the Hall of Fame. Green Bay Packers had a great defense, but people still know them as an offense. What we're trying to get is a seal here and a seal here and try to run this play in the alley. They won their first two. Congratulations for the second year in a row. If you have a great defense, one of the best of all time, you don't have to do that much on offense. If you're the Ravens, you can win the Super Bowl alone with that kind of a defense. Those 2,000 Ravens, I don't believe they averaged more than 20 points a game on offense, but they were able to win the Super Bowl. Come on, D, do what you do best. When Baltimore and Ray Lewis won the Super Bowl, obviously they were a defensive team, and you can say that defense won that Super Bowl. Picked up by Dwayne Stark, touchdown! Every time I look at the scoreboard, it's the team with the most points that wins the game. On Canada Taylor, they went 92 yards and 11 plays. The Pittsburgh Steelers had the number one defense. We win the game. This is a legendary defense. But when it came down to the end, the offense won that championship. Ben scrambles around, throws it back corner of the end zone. Tantonio with a touchdown! Great teams win championships. You gotta have offense, you gotta have defense, and it helps to have special teams too. The rules have changed so much in favor of the offense in the passing game that I think defense winning championships is on its way out. Touchdown! Stay tuned to see why our number one myth didn't prevent our analysts from getting fired up. Hate it. Hate it. I can't stand it. That's the biggest myth in sports. Before we make the last stop on our list, let's recap the way we've traveled so far. Number 10, tackles tell the tale of the tape. The statistic is worthless. Number 9, it's tough for a title team to repeat. Cowboys back to back in the house. Number 8, coaches need to play it safe on fourth down. Go for it! Come on, Turner! Number 7, if a team has a roof, a roof, it won't play with no fire. That was a fact for many years. They weren't tough enough. Number six, when the game's on the line, it's time to ice, ice, baby. They want to be iced, okay? Number five, 
a quarterback needs a rocket arm for his career to take off. Joe Montana said, I don't throw darts at balloons, I throw balloons at darts. Number four, you need to run to set up the pass, even if it causes headaches. Why bang your head against the wall if it's only four steps to go around it? There's the Lambo leap, and there's the Redskin ramp. Number three, a trip to the nurse's office can't bump you from the head of the class. That's a good rule if we're all in grade school. Number two, in the Super Bowl, defense separates champs from chumps. Defense does not win a championship. It will give you a chance. And now, the number one football myth of all time. The prevent defense prevents you from winning. I cringe when I hear people say prevent defense will prevent you from winning a football game. Sh show me the proof. A true prevent defense is almost a Hail Mary defense in which everybody goes deep. Oh my! They're talking about playing a loose song, don't get up and jam on a man coverage, and most of the time it's going to work. Brady takes the snap, back to pass, steps up, and it is incomplete. The New York Giants have knocked off the New England Patriots. If you've got a lead, making the other team move the ball down the field, make them use up the clock, it makes sense. It does mean that the team is going to gain some yards, but if you commit to stopping the team the way you tried to stop them through the first three quarters of the game, you are going to risk getting beat by the big play. And into the end zone for the touchdown. Whoever came up with this pre prevent what? You fight, fight, fight the whole game not to give up any yards. And then all of a sudden you're dropping back 10 and you're giving up 10 at a clip. It ruins your mentality. And then you get down here to goal line, you can't get it back. Thomas is free. Touchdown. It's like asking a guy in a heavyweight fight, take a few rounds off, go slow, and then we're going to bring you back in about the 14th round. It doesn't work that way. PDQ 1200. This fourth quarter defensive strategy that tries to stop big offensive games can get groans from fans. The question is, Prevent defense. And that would be the prevent defense. Yes is the answer to that. The idea that it never works. That is correct. That it doesn't make sense. That's a fact. Well, it's not true. It's the 1960 championship game. The Eagles took the lead late in the game, and they went into a classic prevent defense where they rushed three, dropped everybody else off. The final play of the game, Bart Starr drops back, takes the only play that's available, and Jim Taylor then has to run it from about the 20. At the eight-yard line, Chuck Bednarik made the tackle, and the final seconds ran off. The Eagles win their first world championship since 1949. That's exactly what it's designed for. That's exactly the way it's supposed to work. So while we already know that regular old defense may not win championships, history proves that the prevent defense can. Just ask the 99 Rams. Time runs out, that's it! Very, very high percentage. A winning percentage of prevent defenses prevents you from losing. They help you win the football game. It's over, we're world champions. I went to the Thursday night game when they beat the Jets, beat the Patriots this year, the 34-31 game. I could still see, as the Patriots are driving down the field, that Mangini in the prevent defense, you knew, you knew New England was going to go down and score. Touchdown, Randy Moss! I'll tell you the coaches that used to do it, John Robinson, Joe Walton, they didn't last long. So prevent defenses, are you listening head coaches, also prevent you from keeping your job. What have you been doing all day other than prevent touchdown, prevent first down? Gang get it, gang get it. Prevent field goals. The kick has been blocked. All of a sudden you get to the end of the game and these new signals come out. <laughs> no. Uh-uh. What's a prevent defense do? It prevents you from winning. How many times have we heard that? But when a nickelback does make an interception around the goal line at the end of the game. Intercepted by the Giants! And that is it! The prevents defense helped win that game. You know, if you go into a situation where you're unnecessarily trying to put pressure on a quarterback, creating a one-on-one -on -one situation outside in a critical part of the game, and the defensive back falls down, you get beat. Down the sideline, 30! <laughs> you, you, you're going to want that prevent defense. But here's what's even worse than the prevent defense is the prevent offense. Whoa there, this myth-busting stampede has reached its end. But before we ride off, a final preventative word. The prevent defense, hate it. 
Hate it. I would call that one of the greatest innovations. I can't stand it. In NFL history. I've always hated the prevent. And I will continue to hate the prevent. I don't think it does get the respect it deserves. It works more often than people think. Prevent defense has never once worked. It doesn't work every time, but nothing in football works every time. But to me, I know I'm on a soapbox now. What's worse than the prevent defense is the prevent offense. In your face. Game over. 